Thanks, Julia. Right. Keep those Bibles open and um, let's have a look. I'll get that slide up. Now let's pray and ask God's help. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you speak to us today through the Bible. Help us to see how we need Jesus and how we can turn to him. Amen. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, I spoke to a lady at our lunchtime uh, meeting uh, called Lunch Connection, and she told me she had recently been found in her bathroom, having lost loads of blood. It had frightened her, and you know, it would, wouldn't it? It had frightened her so much that she had got her affairs in order. She sorted out her will, and uh, she contacted all her family, and she said she was ready to face the worst. So I asked, uh, I asked, are you ready to meet with God? Very much so, she said. Very much so. Now she was so confident, and it really intrigued me. And then she continued. She said she was okay with God because she'd never done anything too wrong. In fact, she was fine with him uh, because she volunteered for Macmillan. And sadly, that's the sentiment of so many people in our country today. I'd say it's the sentiment of so many people around the world. Happy to face death, happy to go to be with God, because they think, in their own opinion, they've not done anything too wrong. And so, of course, God would be glad to accept them, especially if the good that they do uh, cancels out that little bit of wrong. But sadly, uh, to accept this view is to be outrageously and dangerously mistaken. And why I say this is because God has spoken to us. He's not remained silent on the matter, on how he can accept us and how we can know him. He's not left it up to our own uh, imagination and our own invention. He is clear on the matter and uh, he has graciously revealed this to us and through the ages he revealed it to people how people could know him and how he accepts us and this has been written down for us in the bible and the bible's in front of you it contains information there gathered over uh, hundreds uh, 2,000 years or so and it's there it's there for the taking and we see, we, we heard two passages read, and we're going to focus on one passage tonight, the very last uh, verse that we read. Uh, open your Bibles and you can see that I'm not making it up, but um, there we are. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men. And we must say this is given to men, women, boys and girls. There's no other name of which uh, we must be saved. And the truth is this, salvation, or to put it another way, uh, being ready to meet with God relies on Jesus Christ. And why we say this is because in this verse, uh, Acts 4.12, it reveals this truth to us. In fact, the verse gives us three really important truths, and we're going to, as we dig into it, we're going to uh, draw out these truths in a moment about salvation or being ready to meet with God. But before I draw out these points, let's just dig a bit more about what this word salvation uh, means or what, what does it mean to be saved? Because it, it teaches us far more than just being ready to meet with God. For, so, okay, so when do we use salvation? When do you use the word saved? Okay, so now I'm not much of a footy fan. Uh, I don't do much sports anyway, but, you know, there we are, uh, as my friends say. But there we are. Imagine the goalie. There's the goalie, and we can all picture a goalie. I think uh, this lady plays for America. I might have got that wrong, but anyway. Um, uh, so there's the goalie. She's on the goal line. Uh, she's getting ready uh, 
And when the ball comes near, their manager, the team, the supporters, and they themselves, what do they want to do? Above all, they want to save that ball from entering the goal. And when the ball is stopped, there we are, she's going for the ball, and everyone shouts, saved! Don't they? And the RNLI, and uh, there we are, there's the fire brigade, the police, what do they do? They spring into action to save those in danger, whether from a burning building, a car wreck, a cat up a tree. People and animals need salvation when they're in trouble or facing danger. It's as though there's a line and it's gonna, the line is going to be crossed and there will be no way back but for this act of salvation. And in the verse we're studying tonight, the salvation that is being talked about is salvation with regards to God. For the Bible says we're not naturally uh, ready to meet with God. The lady I spoke to at Lunch Connection is really uh, sadly mistaken. And the Bible is clear that as human beings, we by ourselves are not good enough in his eyes. We have something about us, deep within us, deep in our, in our hearts. The, the Bible talks about our hearts as our being, the, the very thing that makes us who we are, and the bit that relates to God. And there's something in there that is highly offensive to God, such there's there's nothing that we can do by ourselves that can make up for this offence. And we're going to go into this a bit deeper a bit later. But when it's a time for us to meet with God, God says his anger will come against us. And so it's from this anger we need salvation. However good we think we are, in his eyes we're not good and his anger will come against us. And it's from this, the penalty on this offence that we need to be saved. And so what we're looking at tonight as uh, we come to, to this, uh, it's going to be sobering news to us if, it's, if, if we're new here. But it's also going to be good news. This is the best news that you're going to hear in all the world. Because just as there's a need for salvation, we have a saviour. We have a saviour. And just think, think, imagine you're in a burning building and you're, stuck, you're trapped in the corner and the smoke's filling the room and the flames are coming up to you and there comes the fireman. He's there. He's there to rescue you. This is what this news is about. We're backed into the corner of the burning building and we need a saviour and he is Jesus Christ. And so... There we are, first point tonight. Salvation relies solely on Jesus. Salvation relies solely on Jesus. Now, in our society, uh, we, uh, we celebrate multiple choice. Now, I'm sorry if the next slide fills you with horror. Okay, if I put it up there. Ah, multiple choice exams. Ooh, I remember growing up having to do these things. Okay, but I did like these multiple choice ones because they were a bit easier because you just filled it in where you wanted. But really, no one likes multiple choice exams, do they? But we do like multiple, multiple choices. Uh, think about the supermarket, yeah? How many, I don't know, different brands of toilet cleaner could you want? You know, but multiple choice. How many different brands of, uh, I don't know, what do you like, chocolate? You know, you can get it all now, can't you? But we celebrate multiple choice and uh, spam. You know, okay, now, who remembers Monty Python? Okay, the parody there of spam. I don't want more spam. And if you've never had spam, don't bother with it. But um, <laughs> spam, spam, spam. Uh, we loathe having to make one choice. We want multiple choice. We don't want one, one choice. We actively rebel against more, uh, having just one, one choice. 
to be told that our choice has been taken away, to be told that it's a one-horse race might be a problem for us. But when it comes to salvation, the Bible gives no room for negotiation. The Bible says again and again that salvation and our salvation and the salvation of those that we love and those that we know, those that are neighbours, the people all around the world, it's totally reliant on Jesus. Acts 4 verse 12. Let's read it again. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by men by which we must be saved. See how the verse makes it doubly clear. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven. The under heaven bit is, is a way of saying in all of creation, in all of God's creation, there is no one else. No other name. It's like no other root. No other root. There's no other root. There's no one other than Jesus in whom we can turn and be saved. Now, uh, Abby, my wife, and I live in a lovely flat, and it's provided uh, by the church for us. It's lovely. It's got three bedrooms. Uh, it's got two bathrooms and a kitchen, a garden, but it's only got one door. Only one door, in and out. No back door, one door. You know, it's silly, one door, really. But anyway, but there's only one way in or out. Okay? The same way in, it's the same way out. And it would be foolish, wouldn't it, for me to go, mm, I'm not going to use that door. You know, so you come to our flat and you look from it from the outside and you say, wow, what a lovely flat. I look through the windows, oh, it's great in there. And think to ourselves, what a lovely flat, but I'm not going to use that door. It's the only way in. It would be foolish. And what about if I was on the inside? I'm going to sat there on the, on the sofa and I look out of the windows and I think it's a lovely world outside, but you know, there's only one way out. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it. But that's the balmy thing that people do when it comes to Jesus. God has provided a way of salvation through Jesus. But people, and um, see some lovely faces here, but you might be like these people. You might have been offered this, you might be told of this loads of times, but you refuse to accept this because it's only the one way the one way of salvation and our hearts I, I said you know there's a problem with our hearts our hearts do this God says one thing and we resent what he says and people all around the world they resent the only way to be saved but the reality is there is only one way to be saved and that one way of salvation is through Jesus and if that's like you and if you refuse to accept, may, maybe all your life you've refused to accept this, that there's only one way to be saved, and it's through Jesus. Can I encourage you to come and have a look at the Bible? Okay? Take a Bible home tonight and have a look. Read through the Bible. You will see again and again there's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus. The other thing I get to do here is say, great, I get to help lead Christianity Explored and uh, Nick mentioned it there we are uh, you'll see these cards around there's details about it Christianity Explored and if you really fancy it we're starting another one on Friday come and have a look you'll see that Jesus is the only way to be saved and uh, I'd love to go through that with you okay so lots of opportunities to see that Jesus is the one way to be saved. Now, there's another thing I want to share with you tonight. That salvation is essential. Salvation is essential. Now, some things in life you can take it or leave, can't you? Uh, you might miss out on something, but you can take it or leave it. I can take it or leave it, can't I? It's not essential. Like the other week, uh, so I was a bit ill and someone phoned up, and I don't normally respond to people who phone up, but he said to me, hey, Mr. Nash, 
Uh, what paper do you read? I said, oh, I read the Times. Well, he said, it's your lucky day. Okay, he said, you can, you can buy one month and get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. I thought, wow, I love the Times. Well, something to read when you want to avoid your work and that you read, don't you? But read the Times, buy one month, get two months free. And I took that offer. But, okay, take it or leave it, really. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything, does it? I could, have, I could have taken that offer or I could have declined it. It doesn't matter. It's not essential. But the Bible says that salvation is essential. In fact, to be more accurate, salvation in Jesus Christ is essential. Did you see it in the verse? Like, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Not could or would or can or take it or leave it or maybe on the Sunday, but must be saved. Like the air we breathe or the blood going through our veins. Like there in necessity, the Bible says we really must be saved through Jesus. And the Bible gives us two reasons for this. Um, firstly because it's in, in accordance with God's will or plan he, he's planned it so he has planned it so that we must be saved through Jesus and secondly because there's, there really is no alternative to be saved now I've got those as two points and I'll hopefully make it clearer you see folks history if you go through history you see Loads of people have suggested all sorts of ways that we can be with God and God can be pleased with us. Um, they, it suggested loads of names, loads of religions, do this, don't do this, and God will be pleased. But this verse reminds us, God has ordained it that the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Basically, the Bible teaches us there's a divine necessity that should... We've got to tell this message all over the world. This is the only way. And everyone must be saved by calling on the name of Jesus. Jesus has a unique place in God's plan. God's ultimate act of salvation in preparation for the day when everyone will stand before him and have to bow the knee and say, yes, Jesus is Lord. It's only been accomplished through Jesus. And so people from whatever background, religion or none, must reply, rely upon him. And linked to this, that you know, God's ordained it, that it has to happen this way, without that salvation... People are in a really perilous situation. I was thinking about this. It's like, it's like there's a bog there. And as you walk across the bog, you know, you're in a dangerous thing. You're in a dangerous situation. As I said at the start, we all need salvation. And th this PowerPoint thing's great, isn't it? But it's a medical, it's a medical PowerPoint. And it's great because it's got all these medical diagrams. But you see that our heart has something wrong with it. Our heart, our central being, the bit that relates to God, has something wrong with it. A heart condition called sin. And sin infects our whole being. Sin causes us to be the people that God doesn't want us to be. Sin makes us people who say and do and think things that God isn't happy about. Um, there's a the man at work, there he is, okay, and he's got a, a boss who's annoying, and uh, instead of loving his boss, he's thinking, ooh, that boss. Or, you know, there I am in my car, driving out of here, and someone cuts me up, and I'm like, ooh, that. You know, the, these things, these thoughts come. And instead of being people who love others, instead of people, you know, I, sit, I walk up into Westbourne and there, there are people up, up there begging. And instead of uh, looking out for them, 
housing them, helping them, I walk on by. The problems in this life are very complex, I know. But God wants us to be people who love each other and care for each other. And we're not like that. And that's because our hearts have this problem called sin. And God is angry at us for this. And he says that one day, at a time known only to him, he will hold everyone to account. And if that's not frightening enough, the Bible also talks about um, that, that we're dead to him. We're, we're dead before him. There we are. We're, we walk around. We're living and breathing. But we're spiritually dead to God. We're cut off from him. Dead to him. And crippled. Now why I mention this. So if you're paralyzed, if you're crippled, you can't do anything about it. And the truth is that the salvation that is offered in Jesus is essential. Now, it's all very well to say this. So I could be saying the the way for salvation is through Jesus. But it's great. The Bible uh, gives us proof. Now that verse came at the end of uh, a wonderful story. It's a true account of something that happened. And it's recorded in Acts Uh, uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4 and you see Jesus uh, you see Jesus' disciples uh, Peter and John and they're walking outside the temple and the temple place is where all the religious people are meant to be and what do they do? They meet the man in the street the man is crippled and what do they do? They heal him And I think it's just a wonderful picture of what uh, Jesus does for us. Because uh, as the the chapters go on, the religious authorities start questioning uh, Peter and John and say, you know, how did you do this? Why did you heal this man? How could you do this? And Peter says, it's not, he effectively says, it's not me, mate, it's Jesus. It's Jesus working through us. He alone has no power. People don't have any power. Imagine that today. I mean, do you know anyone who's walked into a hospital and made everyone well? It'd be the end of the NHS, wouldn't it? The end of the NHS crisis. But you see, God at that time gave people uh, powers. It was a special time in history. And he gave those first believers in Jesus, those special powers, to point to Jesus working through them. And that's amazing, isn't it? Their their healing testified to the fact that Jesus, what Jesus had been teaching is true, and what they had been teaching about Jesus is true. By those believers healing the man, it said it was proof that it was only Jesus who could heal just as it was only Jesus who could deal with this problem of sin. You know, it's it's such a great picture to express. In order to be saved from the crippling effects of sin, something we ourselves can't do, and something that religion certainly can't do, Jesus can, and so we need to rely upon him. Now, is that good news? Okay, one way, but Jesus can help us. It's good news. Because it means although we sin, even though God is angry with us, even though we can't save ourselves, Jesus can. Now you might might ask why, or how does he do this? How does he save us? Okay, so lastly, and you've been good for listening to me. Now, okay, salvation needs to be accepted as a gift. Now, look, I've got a gift over there. Tom gave it to me. Tom over there gave me that gift. Look, it's great. Well, we'll just leave it there for now. Now, I love gifts. I really do love gifts. And uh, what's the favorite gift that you've ever received? I don't know. Anyone? Who want to say? What's your favorite gift? Oh, well, I 
had a lovely gift, okay? So, uh, I won't embarrass her. Mary's not here tonight. Mary, Mary, who comes to the church, she gave me a car. And okay, some people think, what's that bloke driving around in that red micro? But it's a fantastic car. She gave me that gift some time ago. And it's blessed me in my work. And it's not that car. And I see my wife looking puzzled. But it's a picture like that, of, of a car like that. Okay. But the point is, the point is, the car's served me well. I've been blessed. And I've been blessed by her kind, kind-heartedness. And she's helped me again and again, given me gifts like like that to get around for my work and for my leisure and some people are truly loving and kind to give such gifts when they can but God grants us the greatest gift in all the world the gift of forgiveness and life the gift of accepting us yeah he accepts us but as we saw salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Do you see the word there? Given. This salvation, found nowhere else, was given. And as with anything that was given, it needs to be accepted with thanks. I think this is such a I don't know, strange concepts to us that something was, would be given without a catch. I think when Mary gave me the car, I was like, you know, a bit embarrassed. You know, what do you want to do that for? You could get some money for that. We struggle, don't we, to believe it's true. When someone gives us a gift, we struggle to believe it. It reminds me of a great sketch in the Christianity Explored uh, sessions on this subject. Picture the scene. Now, this isn't from the CE course, but it, it captures the scene. There's a girl, she receives a gift from her parents. And, you know, you, you'd think she'd be happy. She's got a present, she opens it up, and there's the present she's always wanted. And she frowns, and she says, to her mum and dad how much how much it's a great illustration of what we do to God he grants us the most precious gift he gives us his one and only son Jesus such that whoever would trust in him and his death in our place would be forgiven and would be saved we need Jesus to do this for us. We need Jesus to save us. We're crippled by our sin. And so at great cost, God, the Son, comes down to earth to rescue us from our sin as a gift. But instead of being thankful, instead of accepting what God offers us, we instinctively say, how much? How much? Now, we might not realize we're doing this, but do you see, when we turn to religion, when we turn to, uh, when we say, um, God should accept me because of something I've done, God should accept me because I help at Macmillan, when we say to ourselves, God's going to be happy with me because I've not done anything too bad, or, or eternally, God can accept me because... I've done this, I've done that. That's what we're doing. Um, anything that says we've done something and that's enough. We're doing that. We're, how much God? How much God? Oh, of course, you know. Instead, we need to see and remember our salvation is reliant on receiving God's precious gift, Jesus and what he's done. So can I ask you, have you accepted this gift? Have you accepted this gift? Our verse tonight has compounded us to us that Jesus is the only saviour. 
Don't be fooled into other things. Don't think, God, how, how much do I have to do uh, for you to be right with me? Don't buy into religion, for religion can't save you. Only Jesus can. This verse says only Jesus can save us. If some nice people come around to your door uh, and they say, you've got to accept Jesus, but also uh, the, um, the words of the Watchtower magazine, and you've got to give all your money to the Kingdom Hall, don't be fooled. Point to this verse, okay? It's not Jesus plus all these other things. It's Jesus. Jesus has done what's needed. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No one else can save you. You don't need to add to what Jesus has done. You don't have to rely on what we do or don't do. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Krishna. Only Jesus can save you and me. Salvation relies solely on Jesus. And please, friend, if this is new to you, please don't this, let this fail on deaf ears. Don't let other things get in the way of you getting right with God. Can you see, in this verse, we've been reminded that salvation is essential. The salvation that Jesus offers is essential. It's God's divine plan to save through Jesus. Without this... We're in a dangerous place. But you see, we live in a perilous position if our sin has not been paid for. God says he's angry with us for our sin. We need to see that salvation is a gift and it's essential. Essential for us and for our loved ones. Now, Tom's given me that gift, but I think I'm going to just leave it there. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's a massive gift, isn't it? What do you do with a gift? You go and receive it. You open it up. You receive it with thanks. Do that tonight with Jesus. Okay, do that tonight with Jesus. Okay, now I'm going to pray and uh, if you've not received Jesus and what he's done as a gift, um, I would, I'd encourage you to come and meet me up here. I'm going to sit up here for a little while. Even if you want to come and talk to me, come and talk to me after, but we can talk about this a bit more, okay? Um, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, that you sent the Lord Jesus to save us. Lord, help us to trust in him tonight for our salvation. Help us to trust in him to be made right with you. Pray to Lord that if there's any friends here who don't uh, know this, that they may have the courage to take a step of faith and come and chat to me after and for those of us who, who do know this pray that we go out of here just trusting in your work for us through Jesus and in nothing else Amen